Hi, and welcome back to the channel. In the last few videos in this series, we've been working with CUDF, which is a CUDA accelerated version of Pandas that comes from NVIDIA. In this video, we're gonna be picking up where we left off. Now, in the last video, we learned how to index our data and grab specific columns or specific rows. In this video, we're now gonna be concentrating on how to start manipulating our data. Being a good data scientist means learning how to effectively manipulate data and make it function the way you need it to work for a specific pipeline. And one of the biggest challenges in working with data, especially real world data, is working with messy real world data. And specifically things that have things like missing values, dropping columns when necessary. We're gonna learn how to also change column data types. This is gonna be especially important when you're working with time series data or things like dates. Oftentimes when we've received dates, they're as strings and we need to convert them into a date time format. And this is so that we can do time series based analysis to them. We're gonna learn about all of that in this video, so stick around. I am very excited because this entire series is being done on this machine behind me. This is the Dell Workstation Precision 3680, and inside of it is a beast of a setup. It's got an RTX 5000 ADA from NVIDIA. This is a GPU with 32 gigabytes of VRAM, which is more than enough to not only run inference with most of the models that I need, but also even fine tune them. Models like Quinn 2 VL. This is a massive GPU that not only allows me to leverage machine learning more easily, it also allows me to do things like what we're seeing in this series, load up large data sets, thanks to NVIDIA's GPU accelerated Python packages like QDF, QGraph, and QML. So thank you so much to Dell and NVIDIA for really sponsoring this series and giving me this workstation. This workstation came installed with Ubuntu 24.04 and was very easy to set up. And I'm really excited about this because as you all probably know, I'm a digital nomad. I travel full time. I can't bring a workstation like this with me everywhere I go, despite the fact that it has a very small footprint. That said, I'm gonna be spinning this up as a workstation server that I can call from anywhere I'm at in the world. So for the next few months, while I'm in Argentina, I'll be able to access this GPU and keep on bringing you content from it for the next few months. So thanks again, Nvidia and Dell. Okay, now that we're in our Jupyter Notebook, let's go ahead and start by first using our load extension magic command that we saw in the last video, and we're gonna pass in qdf.pandas. This is gonna go ahead and remember, use at zero code change function here that's gonna let us just go ahead and import pandas like we normally would if we were working on just a CPU. In other words, we're using the exact same syntax, but we're gonna be passing everything off to the GPU. And remember from the last video, we can always check and see what's being passed off to the GPU by using the magic command qdf.pandas.profile. This is gonna open up the profiler. So this cell right here is really doing two things. It's printing off this profiler, which remember shows us all the functions in pandas that are being sent to the GPU and to the CPU. And over the course of the next two videos, we'll really see the GPU and CPU being in charge of different tasks. And the other thing that this cell is doing is it's loading up our data set. Remember, go back to the earlier video in this series that shows you how to go ahead and download this data. And if we keep on going down, we're gonna check and make sure everything is in fact working with our GPU by using NVIDIA.-SMI, which is gonna show everything that we are working with, the NVIDIA RTX 5000. And if we go down, we can take a look with df.head just to take a look at the first row in our data set. And we can see everything right here from article ID all the way over to article. Now I wanna draw a couple pieces of attention right here. Uh, the first thing is that we have this byline field right here. We're gonna be working with this in just a second. I also want you to pay attention to right here, article ID. The purpose of this notebook is really gonna walk you through some of the basic data science methods for cleaning data. We're gonna be dropping rows and we're gonna be taking rows that have empty values and structuring them a bit more correctly with clean data principles. So the first thing we're gonna do is learn how to drop an entire row. We can do this with the df.drop command, which is gonna take one argument here, the row that we want to, uh, sorry, the column that we want to drop, and we're gonna go ahead and print this off and see what our new data frame looks like. And as we can tell, that article ID field is now completely gone. We've effectively dropped that entire column. 
We can also drop things that are NA or uh, uh, NAN, or they have empty values. And if we see right here, we have a lot of empty values in our byline field. But what I want you to do is pay particular attention to the count that we have in our data set. We've got approximately 4.3 million rows in our data set. And I'm gonna go ahead and use this drop NA command, which is gonna take an argument, a keyword argument of subset, which is gonna be a list of different strings. And these strings are gonna be the, the rows that we want to look at. And if that row has an empty value, then we want to drop that row from the data set. This is really useful when you're working with data where you need to make sure that every single row, or maybe every single row with a specific column has a value. In other words, you don't have to wonder if you need to work with that data in some specific way. If it has uh, data that's empty, that can really mess up a lot of data science methods. And so this is a really common thing that you need to get used to. But the problem is when we execute this cell, we notice that we have the exact same count in our data set. In other words, this drop in a function really hasn't worked like it's supposed to. Why is that? Well, this data set represents what we would consider uncleaned data. And this is really indicative of real world data. One of the more challenging things and one of the more annoying things that you're going to have to get used to if you start to work in data science is working with unclean real world data. And one of the most common ways you receive data that's unclean is by a cultivated data set that doesn't really handle empty values correctly or consistently across the data set. Now, how do I know this? Well, this looks empty, but behind the scenes, there's something else happening here. Byline, even if there's nothing there, still has an empty value. It's just a string, not a proper null value, which is a completely different type of data. If you wanna learn more about data types, I have a whole sequence of shorts on this channel that go through each of those. What can we do then? Well, a really good thing to get familiar with early on in pandas is data wrangling with null values. And here we can use the replace function. This is gonna function rather similar to replace that you oftentimes might be used to when you're working with something like strings in Python. And it's gonna take two arguments, the thing that you want to replace, in this case, an empty string, and what you want to replace it with. So it works just like that replace method in Python on strings. And when we execute this cell, we're essentially creating a new data set. And if you want to see really one of the benefits of using QDF, I have printed off here for you all these different time magic commands. If you wanna see the benchmarks for how much faster the GPU is than the CPU for these tasks, you can always go back up to the stop of the top of this notebook and simply remove that load extension magic command. Now that we've replaced all of our empty strings with proper NA values, let's go ahead and take a look at the sum of all the null values by using df.isNull dot sum and summing up all of our null values. And we'll notice that we've got now not empty strings in byline, rather we have a whole chunk of byline data, roughly 3.7 million rows in our data set that has now a null value as opposed to an empty string inside of that field of byline. And now when we go down and try to do that exact same thing and clean up this particular column, we drop in A on byline and we notice now that our data set is now gone from roughly 4.3 million down to 575,000. And we can take a look at this data set by once again printing off DF. And we'll notice now that everything in our data set does have a byline. So this is again a very common way that you're gonna be working with pandas to clean up messy data. Now, another way that we oftentimes receive data is with our dates. Dates <laughs> come to you in a lot of different ways. If you work on data science projects, you're gonna have to get used to wrangling not only null values all the time, but constantly wrangling dates. You're gonna get data from different sources that's all gonna structure dates a little differently. Fortunately, pandas and QDF by extension make it relatively easy to work with temporal data, especially if it's formatted in a fairly consistent way across a, across a data frame, especially. If we notice here, we've got data formatted very specifically, 1938-11-01. And if we took a look at this data, we would notice that this data field is actually a string, which is problematic, especially if we're trying to, uh, to work with uh, temporal data uh, in some kind of structured way. If I do df.info and we take a look down here, we'll notice 
right now, if we look at our date field, we've just got this D type of object. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we can kind of change this up a little bit. One of the things that we can do is we can use pandas to structure temporal data, so date time data, by simply using the PD dot to underscore date time command. This is gonna take one argument, which is gonna be the row or rows that you want to convert into temp, uh, proper date time format. And if we do this, the data is gonna look on the ex surface the exact same, 1938-11-01. But what has happened here? Why, why do this? Well, if we look at df.info now, we'll notice that something has changed. If we scroll down to the date field, we'll notice that now instead of just being an object, in this case, before it was a string, now we see if it's a date time 64 bit. So this means that we've successfully converted our field of date into proper temporal data. Why is this useful? Well, it means you can start doing some really temporal based analysis. If we've converted our date field into date time data, it means that we can access it by individual components by, for example, the unique year. So we can do this by grabbing the row, so indexing the entire data frame at the column of date, and using dot dt, so dot date time, dot year, dot value counts. And this now effectively lets me count all of the years in my data set. Getting used to temporal data and date data and time data in general really lets you get familiar with how to process it and convert it into a proper date time data format. And this allows you to do much more uh, broad analysis across your data set, especially if you want to start working with temporal data analysis. And you can do this all in pandas and therefore QDF with simply one single command, one line that we see right here. That's going to be all for this video. In the next video, I'm going to walk you through some of the things that we can do in QDF and pandas for statistical analysis. And I'm also going to show you when QDF passes jobs off to the CPU, not just the GPU. And we're also going to see the real benefits and benchmarks of using the GPU for doing things like data cleaning once again towards the end of the next lesson. So pop on over and join me in the next video. Thanks for listening.